Welcome to Our Jewish Roots. Shalom and thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I'm Joshua. And I'm Caleb. Rochim Habayim. Welcome, friends. Some good Hebrew, uh, friends, brother. Friends, I got that part. Yeah. Yeah. Friends, and you are our friends. You, you are friends right. of Zola Levitt Ministries for over 17 years, That's even right. though you might be new, literally, on this platform, yeah. on this stage. <laughs> it was weird to start in elementary school, but, you know, <laughs> after, after <laughs> having this kind of pedigree, it's been fantastic. Yeah. Today, I'm excited because we are talking about uh, gambling. You say gambling. Making. How's that in the Bible? Well, casting lots. Lots, yes. Now, I've never been a fan of gambling. The idea of giving away something and not necessarily getting something in return does not appeal to me, but <laughs> there's some people out there that have done it. And Aiken's one of these guys. Casting lots in the Bible, you know, God uses it a lot of times to... Uh, to catch them. To, to catch, catch to people. Figure out who, and, who's the one? You know, in Jonah, they're like, who is the bad guy on board? Why is God judging us? It was Jonah. Uh, they, they cast lots over Yeshua's robe, so you know it's not very good. Mm -hmm. but, but God still used that as a method, even for selecting the delineation of the 12 tribes' territory. There was lots being cast, so uh, that, that plays into the story later on. God is using you. He's also using Dr. Seif in Israel That's right. to teach us our, our lesson today, our lessons. And uh, thank you for being here. We're glad, we're you're, glad you're on board. Yes. Yeah. Right now, we take you to our dramatic reenactment, followed by Dr. Seif's teaching in Israel. Let's go there now. Jericho was a miracle, but why? Why did Achan have to stain the memories of victory by hoarding all that silver and gold? Adonai, you are forgiving in our succeeding loss at the city of Ai. A lesson learned, but I grieve. I so grieve the loss of my men. Sir, our loss at I was not your fault. You rent that cloak because Achan coveted the plunder of Jericho. But I'll never forget. Thirty-six men lost forever because of greed. The Lord gave us Jericho, but he never, ever said that we could keep the bounty. It belonged to the Lord. All of it! And the city of Ai would have been ours as well, if not for the sinful plunder of Achan. Let this be a reminder. May it never happen again! There were only 3,000 in that city. We should have taken it easily. If, and only if, the Lord is well pleased with our efforts. It is not by might, says the Lord. We can still take the city of Ai. Sit. Let me show you what God has told me. We are here. I is here. You will lead your men to the back of the city at night to this side of Bethel and wait until I summon you. And you, sir? I will lead my men the following day north and we'll camp here. In the morning, my men will set up in the valley across from the city, whereupon the men of I will see us and pursue us. An ambush. The city will be left vacant, unarmed. Yes, but you will not besiege the city until I turn and raise my spear. Then you will set the city on fire. They will see the smoke ascending. Then my men and I, we will attack the confused lot, utterly destroying them. Magnificent plan, sir. 
The battle is ours. Learn this lesson. The plan is not mine, and it is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. It's been a miraculous journey. The Jordan River has dried up to facilitate its crossing. The mighty walls of Jericho have fallen down, and now, with heaven-sent cunning, Joshua leads his men to yet another victory at the city of Ai. I went up in flames. Finally, Israel got burned beforehand, however, and in another sense, and I'm going to tell that story here today. It's a tragic story, actually. Victory is one thing, defeat's another. In the Bible, we get a little bit of both. Actually, in the scripture, if you look at the miraculous victories so far, the parting of the sea, the Jordan, the Israelites crossing through, yes, that's 17 verses for that. If you look at the, the miracle and the war at Jericho, a sum total of 27 verses for that. The Battle of Ai, a small city, it shouldn't have taken much. It was a tragedy, 81 verses by my reckoning for that in the Hebrew Bible. Why is it that something that went horribly wrong initially, that should have been relatively easy, why does the text give so much attention to that? I want to look at that because there's a lesson to be learned from that, in my opinion. And I think uh, that Joshua wants us to know that lesson because there's so much spent on a world that went bad. At the first, however, you look at the end of chapter 6 in the book of Joshua, it's, it ends on a good note. Rayihi Adonai et Yehoshua. And the Lord was with Joshua. And so it seemed, obviously, after a, a great miracle, we're told, Rayihi Shemo Bechol Ha'aretz. And his fame spread throughout the land. It ends on a very good note and then pivots. By the time we get to chapter 7, we leave a triumph and we go to a tragedy. It should have been an easy victory. Uh, the literature tells us it didn't take much. The next stop on the train was a city called Ai, a small town, dispatch, a small group for all intents and purposes. Should have been easy, but it went bad and people wondered why. Why failure? Why does it happen? Well, we're told in verse 1, Rvayimalu b'nei Yisrael ma'al ba'cherem. We're told the children of Israel committed a trespass concerning the devoted thing. I want to explore that for two reasons. Number one, what's the devoted thing? That is, that uh, the, uh, the spoils of war were not to go to the people who were enacting the war, that it was to be wholly devoted over to God. The other thing that's interesting, it says the children of Israel committed a trespass, but not really. I say that because when you read on, Ravayikach Akan, and took Achan of the devoted thing, Min HaCherem, as it goes on to say after listing his lineage. It's interesting, there was one man that sinned, but tragically they all were held to be culpable for it. That is to say, they went to war, they weren't supposed to take plunder, they weren't supposed to take spoils of war, booty, they weren't to have it. This is a religious issue, it's not to be, this isn't an opportunity for self-aggrandizement, it's not a, a time for self-gain. But he saw some loot, and he took it and he seized it, contrary to the command, contrary to what he was told, and this caused a great loss for the Hebrews. The rabbis, out of this, look at what's referred to as collective responsibility. One man sins, as I'd said, they all pay the price. And in the Jewish world, this carries on in modernity, too. It's understood that every Hebrew carries the name. Uh, everyone's an ambassador of the people. I liken it to, you know, if someone has a plumber and it's a bad plumber, rips people off, so they'll say, listen, we'll never call that plumber again. But if the plumber's wearing a yarmulke, if he's a Hebrew, and he rips the people off, doesn't do a good job, people say, ah, those Jews, 
There's a sense in which he represents everyone, and that certainly is the case here. The imperative uh, for individuals to live virtuous lives, to keep their word, uh, that sterling virtue, the more so in antiquity, was inculcated into the younger generation. There was a premium on acting righteously. To be righteous didn't mean just to go to church on Sundays or a synagogue on Saturday. To be righteous meant to live with sterling character, that is to say, above reproach, that is to say, uh, following instruction. And in this case here, don't seize that which doesn't belong to you. It comes in different forms. Robbery, you're taking it from a person. Theft, you're taking it from an outside uh, property. Uh, robbery, you're taking it off of a person. Burglary, you're taking it from inside of a dwelling, I should say. There's different ways in the penal code in America that we speak of seizure. It's interesting in uh, the Hebrew Bible where the whole notion of theft, taking what doesn't belong to you, is uh, uh, it, it's egregious in so many ways, and so it is. The Battle of Ai, which should have been an easy picking, it turned out bad. The Hebrews were defeated decisively. Later, they're going to regroup, learn the lesson. It's going to be noted in the text. The problem was Achan. That's going to be dealt with, and then we'll go on to good success, a story that we'll look at in the next segment as we look at being more than a conqueror. Dr. Seif nailed it on the head. God wasn't with them in this battle, and that is why they lost. Yeah. And all the other battles, God was with them. Why was God not with Joshua this time? Well, there's three things that Joshua kind of messed up on that he didn't do. Number one, oh. Joshua was always supposed to consult with God first on whether or not he should go into battle. Hmm. He didn't do that this time. He listened to his spies. He would have known that there was a problem if he would have consulted if God. If he would have consulted God. Yeah. Uh, the second problem that he had was hmm. he didn't send in every able-bodied man as God had instructed. That's he right. sent in a small garrison of 3,000 men. Mm -hmm. And because he did this, 36 men died. Now, you may not think that 36 men with the 3,000 yeah, fighting a is, a, is a big number, but think about this. They were undefeated up to this point. Israel mm -hmm. had not lost a man in battle. Mm -hmm. And so for 36 men to die on the battlefield, they shook Joshua up and it shook the people up because mm -hmm. is God not with us now? What's going on? But the third problem that Joshua did was kind of the uh, old Jewish tradition, woe is me, oy vey, what happened? Why, Why did you, you leave me? You said I was gonna do this, I got the sackcloth and the, you know, all this stuff. And instead of fixing the mistakes, yeah. God said to him, stand up, be a man, and go get the sin out of your camp. Go mm. do what I said to do. And if he had done that, instead of this third thing, mm. then none of this might have happened. And people might be thinking, what was the importance of not taking the plunder from Jericho? It doesn't sound like a real big deal, uh, but it was severe to God. This was supposed to be the first fruits offering of their plunder. It was supposed to be the first tithe that they gave to God. And in trusting God and giving him all of that plunder, it was a promise that he would give them more, that he would give them more victories. And I know a lot of pastors like to jump on the bandwagon for his message, see you don't take the tithe from God, that belongs to God. Uh, but this is a, a completely different system, if you would understand, from the Old Testament to what we have in the New. Um, if you've ever heard us on Bearded Bible Brothers, our online social media series, we've talked about tithe and offering a lot. And it's important to understand that we cannot fulfill the criteria of tithe that is listed in the Old Testament. It's too much. It, it's too much. <laughs> it's not even 10 percent, guys. It's like 20 to 30 percent, depending on the yearly cycle. And there's animal sacrifices involved. You have to have a temple present. And you would give this sacrifice to God. The priest would, you know, would do what he was supposed to do. He would give you a portion back. How many pastors do you know give you your tithe back? Here, here, you can have this. We don't really need it all. It doesn't happen today. And thus, if you place your yourself under the law, then you have to fulfill all the criteria under the law. And it's no matter, it's no, it's no longer a matter of the heart. That's why the New Testament yes. system, since Messiah fulfilled all the old, is now about the heart, giving of your heart. Giving and an offering. Yeah. Giving of your time, mm -hmm. of your gifts. That's right. When you see a need reaching out in that gift and what the need is, money isn't always the need at the time. 
And so when, when Yeshua said he wants you to give, he wants you to give of your heart freely, joyfully, and yeah. that's what he's looking for now. Not to be bound by the law and to do something simply so that you can mark something off of your list yeah. because that doesn't please him. It pleases him that you've chosen to step out and to give of yourself in an offering where a need is me needed to be met. That's right. And now we're going to go back to Jeff in Israel where he's going to reveal the results, the conclusion of removing that sin from the camp. After Achan was found out, he was summarily executed. And with that lesson learned and that issue tended to, then the children of Israel again commenced with the taking of I. And there's a kind of genius in this too. It lacks the, the, the miraculous component that we saw with the crossing of the Jordan earlier and that we saw with Jericho. There it's clear there's divine agency at play. Here you have the angel of the Lord still going before the people of the Lord, but it really manifests with a kind of creative genius, a strategy. The name of the game is to get these from I outside of the city. So Joshua kind of plays the hand. He, uh, he strategizes to secure uh, their departure. They had already defeated the Hebrews, so there's a frontal assault where the, he, where the Hebrews retreat and those in I come out of the city to go get them. Meanwhile, there were others set in ambush and when the city's vacated, they torch the city. They burn the city. The people look back and they realize they've been had and now they're squeezed in both directions where uh, the net result is there is a decisive victory at I and then the king of I, who survives the battle, is executed afterward. Now, I don't want to uh, glory in anybody's death. That's not the point here. And I don't even think it's the point of the story at I, because it's bookended by a religious principle, more so than it is a military victory. I mention that because in the first segment, and then I developed it a little more here, just at the start, there was a problem with Achan who, who disobeyed. And the disobedience cost him and Israel dearly. That issue was tended to then, and the Hebrews enjoy good success. And again, in this series, we're looking at being more than a conqueror. Well, maybe there's a correlation between success and compliance. It seems to be the case because before we get out of this story, the appendage to it in the, uh, in, in the, in the eighth chapter, it's interesting in verse 30, I want to look at it and then pivot to 32 because there's something here that is very important. We're told in the Hebrew Bible, Az Yehoshua Mizbeach Ladonoi. That is after this, we're told that Joshua built an altar to the Lord. We saw fire to begin with, and I'm sitting behind one now, but here a Mizbeach has built an altar. And then we're told in verse 32, Vayik al ha'avonim et Mishnah Torah Moshe. And there's an altar that's built, and on it he'll write uh, the, the, the Mishnah Torah. Now, the, the, the rabbis say, you know, what are we looking at here? Are we looking at just the Ten Commandments? Some say that. Some say the 613 commandments. Uh, some say the whole of the Torah. There are these stones that are taken and carved out. Some say miraculously. The point is, is after the battle, after the death, then you have the publishing of the Torah. And the point is, there's a kind of insistence that, uh, that obeying Torah takes precedence. We're told in English that he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, Asher Kotav Lifne Bnei Israel, that he wrote before or in the face of all the children of Israel. There's two compliance stories here that I think the author wants us to understand to be a secret to success. There's a correlation between obedience and success in life, obeying the command. Uh, you hear in scripture, Shema Israel, hero Israel, and it's said over and over again. 
and for that matter, Jesus, Yeshua is on record over and again saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Of course, people have ears and the eardrums vibrate. They hear, but they don't really hear. But the rabbis say the hearing isn't just good enough. Hear it, that you may do it, that you may observe it. There's the next step. You have to begin by hearing and then doing. And the doing translates into success in life. That is to say, follow the divine instruction. Shlomo, Melech Israel, Solomon, the king of Israel, is said to have put together a collection of short, pithy wisdom sayings. Uh, there's a genre, a type of literature, sapienta literature, wisdom literature. You look at Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, it's an example of wisdom literature. And it starts off, hear my son, your father's instruction, obey your mother's teaching. And here's the heavenly father. And it's all commended in the biblical text. There's an imperative to hear the command. And by the way, to that end, that's why attending a house of worship is important. And what's important in that house of worship is a minister that opens up the word and people can hear them and they're commended to the mind's eye of constituents. And why is that? Because there really is a correlation when it comes to success in life between hearing the divine command and doing it. Good things can happen, not just to the Jew, as in the case of this conquest that I, not just to the, not just to the people like me, but people like you, all of us, when we hear, when we do, like Joshua then, we can be more than conquerors. Klein Mailspin is an officer with the Israeli Defense Forces and I had an opportunity to sit down and talk to him about being more than a conqueror. Here particularly, he gave voice to the importance of learning to strategically think outside of the box. Sarge, good to be with you today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Question, the battle of I, very, very strategic. I mean, it seems to me there is a leader of the Israeli Defense Forces that's thinking outside of the box, this genius there. How much of an emphasis is placed on strategy in military today? Absolutely, there is. And there's also this thinking outside the box and solving problems, even doing something that might seem like not the conventional way, such as in October 17, 1973, Yom Kippur War. I remember down in the Sinai Peninsula, uh, to the Suez Canal, they said, let's do a water bridge that floats on the water and drive the tanks across and let us surround the third army of the Egyptians. And everyone thought, "That's how's that gonna ever work? But we did, we carried that out and that helped us win the entire Sinai Peninsula, and which we then later gave back. But it's thinking outside the box. Yeah, strategy and a little bit of chutzpah, yes? Precisely. Now, I want to pivot from that because we're watching this program, people are watching it, and they need biblical medicine for their life's assorted hurts. Uh, would people do well to learn to think outside of the box, to get some creative solutions and move forward with those? Well, absolutely. And I think a lesson from the Bible is when you trust in your commander, he's our commander. You sh of course, Yeshua is our, is our friend, our savior, but he's also our commander. And when something is said, we have to say, I will see this mission through and I will trust the orders that I've been given from above. And, uh, and I love how Ord Wingate, this man, he's a Christian man. You'd think, why would he care about training the IDF? He started when it was the Irgun the Palmach, the Lehi, and the Haganah. And he trained these people, even against the British army orders sometimes, would train these guys. And he actually was in En Harod, which is Gideon's spring. And he got so inspired by how these biblical characters were able to go and advance and take ground and, and see the mission to successful fruition. Dr. Siphon Chaim, thank you for your insight. When we're on tour, Chaim comes with us. Chaim teaches us and he tells us about the victory after victory after victory yes. that IDF still has. God's hand is still on them. That's right. It's fantastic. Still on his people. Can I go back to Aiken here yeah, where Dr. Yeah. Seif was teaching? His punishment was pretty severe death. Well, yeah. Can you explain that? Well, 
uh, the punishment death for generations, was, right? Death yeah. for generations. You know, the law was a severe taskmaster to bring us to Messiah. It was harsh so that people could understand the severity of sin. But we're talking about a generational curse here. And God warned Moses that a generational curse passed to the fourth generation of the bloodline. That iniquity would perpetuate. So if, you know, your forefather, he was a, you know, he was a liar, a cheater, a thief, a murderer, you would have that inclination as a son to carry on that same sin when you would grow up. Mm -hmm. And so there was no way to cut off those sins back then. The, the blood of Yeshua hadn't been applied yet. So it was harsh. They had to cut off the family line. That's, that's kind of why it was so severe. God told him to go in and take, you know, wipe out every man, woman, and child from Canaan, he, break that curse. And that's why they killed Achan and his whole family. Wow. That, that is so tough. We're, we're grandparents. Yeah. We have three grandkids. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine if Dave did something a little sketchy. Yeah, that yeah. our grandkids They're have to suffer. I mean, that's it's crazy. That's huge. But that's th harsh. This shows this shows why the law was the law. Yeah, man wanted to be able to earn it on his own. How mm -hmm. can I have salvation for myself? Mm -hmm. And God said, "This is what perfection requires." Mm -hmm. The entire point of seeing the the severity of the law was, if you really want to earn it, you're going to have to live perfectly. And if you don't live perfectly, you're going to have to commit sacrifices that are going to seem atrocious. Your entire family line, if you sin this way. Mm. When Yeshua came and he gave his blood on that cross for us, when he lived perfectly in every aspect of the law, like no man, woman, or child had ever done in history, he paid a price that enabled us to no longer have to live mm. with that severity hanging over our heads. So often we look today up at God and we shake our fists at the heaven and say, how could a good God let this happen? But that good God gave his only son for us mm. so that if we messed up in our lives, we wouldn't have to have our entire family line sacrificed to stop sin from polluting further generations. Mm. Yeshua died for us. Mm. You don't have to live under the curse any longer. Mm. All you have to do is ask for forgiveness, submit your heart to him, and your life, your legacy is sealed by his blood for eternity. Mm. And that is why we live freely today under that redemption, under that price that was paid. And you can too as well. Amen. I've mm. got to say, I love singing about amazing grace that we experience right. these days. Yes. Right. Great yes, teaching. Thank you for your heart message. More next week. That's right. Next week, the Israelites get tricked. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. another bad yeah. setback. Again. But okay. for now, would you would you close us out? Oh yes. Yes. Well, as usual, we say Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites. Visit our website levitt.com for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There you can order this week's resource or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries helps us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.